All right, so everybody, welcome to our second Q&A with John Vervecki. We're going to be recording uh, today, and we've just created a, a YouTube channel to host these uh, these recordings that we do for the events that we have here. Uh, so please be aware that, that we are recording, and in the notes channel up up top, uh, you can find a link to the to the YouTube channel. So we'll try to get the recording out for anybody who wants to re-listen or uh, who, who couldn't get a chance to be here. So thank you, John, uh, for, for being here again. We're going to try to do these, I think, every two weeks. Yes, please. Yeah, so that that's great. And uh, we'll try to figure out the best times. Uh, I know, you know we have an international audience, so we'll, we might do some experimenting to find out the, the optimal times or different times to give people a shot. But we'll try to find out what works for everybody. But so we'd like to shoot your questions. If you could, whoever... Uh, ask questions last time, maybe hold back and let some new people ask some of the first questions and then uh, come in a bit later. Uh, so who has a question for, for John? I do. Um, well, great. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so I have watched what you've said, John, about the having mode. And try and just sort of been trying to think about what it specifically means because I wasn't it didn't it didn't it was sort of a bit general and what I've thought is perhaps that it means sort of keeping the self static and trying to kind of fit the world to oneself so it's sort of agent centric um, and then obviously from there I considered that there had to kind of be an opposite of that where we just sort of let the world imprint on us um i don't know if that corresponds to the being mode or not and then i then i thought perhaps that sort of having both of those in a cooperative relationship is what would be kind of optimum cognition i was just wondering if that what whether that's an accurate representation of what you meant and what you think um, of it. i mean it sounds a little bit more like piagetian assimilation and accommodation which I do talk in a series about. Um, the idea that the having mode is static um, has got, an, uh, I think I would agree with, uh, because the having needs are, are homeostatic needs. They're needs of maintaining homeostasis. So water, you, have, you need to have water because uh, for home, and, right, and it'll be a self-terminating um, need fulfillment because you, once you achieve homeostasis, you're not thirsty anymore. Um, so in that sense, I think the having mode is more static. Um, and the being mode is definitely developmental. I wouldn't say that's the world making an impact on you. Um, that's where needs are met, not by trying to achieve or maintain or conserve a homeostatic state, but actually needs that are met by complexifying cognition in some way, getting in emergent functions. Um, and so while you definitely need, if you're not a poetic thing, to have a set of practices that are going to maintain the internal environment's homeostasis, and that's what the having mode um, is directed towards. You also need um, a set of needs that motivate the organism you know, to complexify its cognition so that it can adapt to and be ready for a much wider variety of both social and physical environments. Uh, so for example, and we, we tend to represent this with uh, not with things that you consume or control, uh, but with virtues that you cultivate. So, so the, like the example I give about becoming more mature, what we mean by that, I mean, we literally mean at some level that you're complexifying your frontal lobes so that you get capacities for reflection and self-direction and pursuing long-term goals that are uh, much more adaptive to you uh, long-term over many, many different contexts. And so, um, I think in both of them, both the having mode, I mean, in both, you're solving problems, but you're solving a, a different kind of problem. The first is, like I said, it's a categorical problem of trying to control things, uh, whereas the developmental needs that you find within the being mode are more, they're not directed at a specific object or target uh, that you're trying to control or consume. They're actually directed towards uh, the complexity and uh, dynamic potential you have 
uh, for connecting to yourself, to each other in the world. So that's why those needs are much more about those connections that establish meaning in life, establish identity. Did that help? Yeah, pretty much. Um, just one question to make that absolutely clear. Is there such thing as a pathology of excessive being mode? Because oh, sure. being mode sounds very positive when you explain it this way. Well, actually, I mean, the, the, the pathology is never in any of the modes, but in modal confusion. And there's two types of modal confusion. Um, one is where you try to meet the being, no, the being needs within the having mode. And that, that, so to use my example that follows on what I just said, you know, instead of complexifying your cognition and becoming more, more mature, you go out and buy a car, like you do symbolic consumption instead. But of course, you can have the reverse. Um, you can have the reverse where you're, uh, you're trying to satisfy having needs within the being mode. Um, and I mean, that's not as prevalent in our culture. Uh, but they, we used to, uh, when I was growing up and I was, I was brought up in a church, right. Uh, there used to be certain people we would, we would be sort of criticized and avoided. Uh, and the, the phrase that was used was being too heavenly minded to do any earthly good, uh, that they were always in talking about meaning, uh, and things like this, but they, they didn't actually make any difference in, uh, directing people's having needs like making sure that people are well-fed, uh, well-clothed, et cetera. Um, so that pathology does occur. It's not as prevalent in our culture as the other kind of modal confusion, but there have been times in the past um, and in certain, uh, and like I said, I experienced in my own life where there are individuals who misconstrue um, and a, a particularly vicious form of modal, const uh, modal confusion about this is practices around mortification of the body that somehow by destroying the body um, you, and, and trying to get rid of its having mode needs, you will achieve great spiritual perfection. You can see this both within the Christian tradition. You can see it also in the Buddhist tradition where Siddhartha practices, you know, asceticism to the point where his, you can see his spine from, well, even though you're facing him from the front, he stars himself to the edge of death. And then he realizes that this is all actually very useless. The having mode has its place. Uh, and um, the, the thing is not to try and crush the having mode, but to appropriately remember the being mode. To, the, the, the answer is to not fall into modal confusion. So I think the answer, it, it, there's two ways in which we can be modally confused. Both of them, I think, are disastrous for us. I highlighted the one that Fromm highlights because Fromm thinks that our current um, normativity of the market as sort of our de facto God tends to create much more uh, modal confusion where people are in a, in a mistaken fashion trying to satisfy their being needs within a having mode. But the other is completely possible and does happen historically. Thanks, completely makes sense. Thank you. Anyone else? Don't well, I asked last time, so I'm <laughs> waiting. No, go, go ahead. Um, okay, so this kind of ties back to the Burberry interview. Um, I wasn't very happy with the way that I dealt with my question. It took me a while to figure out why. And um, the conclusion I came to is that I was trying to ask um, on behalf of Christians, and it wasn't working very well. So um, to put it in my personal terms, I wouldn't put narrative into a metaphysics. So I don't have an objection there. But my question is, if a narrative has a norm of realism um, and it cannot place itself within a metaphysic, is that, nor is that narrative not then a self-undermining narrative? And does that not maybe lead to the um, postmodern skepticism towards grand narratives as a whole? So let me, let, let me make sure I'm understanding your question. Uh, you accepted um, a point about trying not to put narrative into our metaphysics. But now you're tra talking about um, sort of the, what do they call it when they do work on fictional entities? It's a suppositional metaphysics or something, you know, that there's a, there is a, 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 a purported realism within fiction. And that in one sense 
undermines it, at least performatively, because the realism, the fiction is undermined by the fact that the very medium in which it is found is, is not, does not have any metaphysical grounding. And that's something that the postmodernists have pointed out. Did I get you correctly? Um, sort of. Um, I would say that I don't consider myself a realist. Um, so it's not, so my narrative doesn't try to uh, um, frame itself in real terms, at least uh, as real as understood, you know, in the, in the classical Western sense. Um, so I, I don't see a problem with the fiction as such. What I see a problem with is if you say the fiction must not be a fiction. And I think that's the disconnect. And I don't see, if you can't put the narrative into a metaphysic, then I think that any narrative of realism will create absurdity. I think we're agreeing. Um, yeah. So, so I guess, the, I mean, maybe the, the, maybe the disagreement, and maybe this, this would be a, a, a very long thing. I know we've discussed this back and forth a bit. Um, so if you're not a realist, like, are, are, so are you, are you treating like is it an idealistic stance you take i don't mean in the romantic sense i mean in like in you know in the berkeleyan or 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 you know fictian sense it, um it, sort of for, for me it's a little bit complicated because i would say that that things are real and then uh nothingness is not real but you can still speak about it just not in real terms so um uh, if an, oh, a narrative so you, you, just to make sure i understand you because uh, Something that's similar to that is the Neoplatonists who define realness in terms of intelligibility, but the one is beyond intelligibility. And so it is therefore beyond being. It is something like, is it something like that you're talking about? Uh, yes, if you take being to be static and then you're trying to talk about the dynamic and the dynamic is beyond being. Like th there's a very much at an attempt within the Western uh, tradition that I see that attempts to make everything static. And if you tie that back to our conversation about Aristotle and the dynamic telos, that's exactly yeah. like it's, it's trying to get back at that same problem of trying to kick the narrative into a dynamic set, into a dynamic language that doesn't depend upon realism. And it's the attempt to staticify everything and make it um, discrete and like a self-contained entity that, that, that fractures the whole thing. And that's, the, that's fundamentally what realism attempts to do, at least within the Western understanding of realism. Yeah, well, yeah, well, classical realism. I mean, you have mo very many modified forms of realism, like Putnam's sort of integrated uh, pragmatic realism. Um, but let, let, let's play in that in the field in which you've set things up. Um, so I think I agree with you there too, uh, uh, and I think that overlaps with the argument I have uh, made that the the uh, for all my love of Plato and the Neoplatonists, but especially Plato. Um, the equation of most real with perfection and static completion, uh, and that, that is our model for sacredness. And then, of course, that ramifies through all of our normative judgments. I think that's a fundamental mistake. I think that's a very fundamental mistake. Um, and I, I would come very, in very close to what you've said there, but I would make a distinction because you draw a distinction between sacredness and the sacred. And I would say it's appropriate to speak of the sacred as static, but you want sacredness to be dynamic. And you, you, you want a balance of both. I, I kind of see you as a reactionary in that regard. And the thing is about reactionaries is that they have to go too far in order to be effective. So it's not really a criticism of you, but it's like, we've got we to gotta get both. <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah, okay. Uh, I, I think maybe I have a sense of what you're talking about, um, that... There might be some aspect in which the eternal um, is grounding space and time, and therefore uh, shouldn't be thought of in sort of dynamical terms. I, I think that's also something I would plausibly consider. Um, yeah. Okay. So very. I mean, this is getting a little bit esoteric, but I would say that the static is more like um, what is of origin, and then the dynamic is more of like what is of destiny, and like the now is kind of the meeting of origin and destiny, and so you've got. You, you, it's, it's like a, um, you were speaking about modal confusion. The, the yeah. issue is about uh, like the, the, the having mode is like the static mode and the being mode is like the, in your language, is the dynamic mode. I, I would say that the being is static and the becoming is dynamic. But the idea is to shift the narrative off of a norm of uh, realism in the static sense so that it can 
that can operate in the nothingness, that, that dynamic nothingness, which, which speaks towards the renewing sacredness. If you, if, I don't know if that lands. No, that landed well. I like that. That was good. Okay, so um, would you agree then that the, the Christians and the realists have a real problem in that they can't make sense of a narrative that isn't within a metaphysic when you are supposing realism as a norm? And do you see a way around that if you are uh, if you're trying to 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 craft your your framework in terms of realism? Um, so you you're asking me to speak on behalf of the Christians now. Um, well, no, I, I I would say that you try to your your framework attempts to create to to hold realism as a norm. Would you agree with that? Well, yeah, because uh, but because I think it is a norm, but there's, uh, you already said you, 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 you accept the normativity of realness. Uh, and that's typically what I'm talking about. I want to be able to make comparative judgments and say well, some, some things are more real than others. Yeah. The, the, the thing is that, um, I was speaking with, um, Jared Morningstar on this, like the, I think there might be a disconnect between the Western and Eastern no notions of realism. And I kind of get the impression like uh, Nishitani, his idea of real is thingness and nothingness together. Yes. And, exactly. Right. So I think that you're trying to do that as well. But that, that seems to me to be incompatible with the Western notion of real, which holds the realness. No, as that's why I did, do disagree with you. I mean, you, in Plotinus and Proclus, the one is both no thingness and ultimately uh, real, right? It, it, like, I, I think there's a similarity in major traditions in the West. Um, I think you're right that when that gets taken up, when that Neoplatonism gets taken up into Christianity, it, that inner, that, 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 that keeping of the two together uh, becomes very, very problematic. Uh, for, for, for well, yeah, I, th I think this, uh, um, if I'm right, the Council of Nicaea had a similar kind of conflict over um, the meaning of hypostasis because yeah. of, it like, had a different meaning in Greek and, and like it meant sub substance to the, to the Latin, if I remember correctly. And, yeah, uh, substance not as stuff, but in the real Aristotelian sense of stuff, substance. When it's supposed to mean the underlying principle, right? Uh, right, so I, I think I, 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 where I'm trying to... Do, I think you're trying to get at the underlying principle notion of realness, and I'm focusing more on the substance notion of realness when I'm trying to speak about oh, realness. Like, okay, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but part of my argument is I think there has been uh, the underlying principle notion of realness. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm I'm not I'm not uh, criticizing here. I'm just trying to speak to the miscommunication because what sure. I think is going on with the Christians is that they might be hearing. The substantive side of it, when you're talking about the underlying reality side of it, yeah, yeah, and a disconnect. I, yeah that's astute. I agree with that. Uh, and you know, I've been trying. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a conversation with Paul about this. And uh, I mean, even even the translation of hypostasis into person, and then taking person not to be sort of the same as an Aristotelian substance, but making it personal, like us. There's there's been a sort of series of moves in there that I think we need to go back and unpack more. Uh, right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That that that's right where I am, because uh, the whole narrative thing seems to be tied into this idea of what it what, what it means to be a person and how exactly. the the yeah. personal ties in with all of these other concepts. And yeah, I think that the right. real crisis, to a large degree, has been uh, like that. This whole language is fractured in on itself, and we can't make sense of ourselves. And because of that, we can't really create a language to connect to other people properly anymore. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, and I, I've been trying, I don't know how successful, I've been trying, like when I've been having discussions with Paul and Mary and JP, uh, and, uh, and then people on the other side, like Ray, Ray Kelly, about is it possible to separate, you know, sacredness or, the, you know, God as the symbol for that, uh, from the notion of the personal to try and get away from that whole, but there's, there's, there, there are a lot of these, these moves that we've just that we've agreed on have happened. They're locked so tightly; it's hard to get them to articulate in the in the in both the sense of speak and open up spaces between the parts, uh, so you can get clear about uh, you know your own tradition might not even be committing you to this uh, in the sense that you know before that collapse happened, there were many alternative ways. Even I think within 
the West, like, I, like we've explored for, for um, doing, uh, relating to sacredness more appropriately. I, I, I don't, I, 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 I like, I take your point very well though, that one of the things that locks, the two are locked together, right? The collapse of hypostasis into a personal being is locked into trying desperately to see the universe as a narrative, really, really a narrative. Yes, I think that's right. And I'm not quite sure um, how to unfold that uh, for people. That's very, very tricky. I'm, I'm yeah, sorry. So, oh, so I have a, a, a another question from uh, Ante Lechiel in the in the voice chat. So, so he asks, uh, I have a question about the use of heuristics as a guide for truth. If heuristics bias us, how can we use principles like parsimony, Occam's razor, etc.? Wouldn't parsimony be a value that biased you away from truth, insofar as there are no objective values? Um, so saying there's no objective values, uh, it, first of all, let's work backwards as equivocal. That could mean the universe doesn't possess value, or it could mean that those values do not act as proper norms upon a practice. Which I so while I agree with the first, you know, there's no objective values written into sort of the physics of the universe. I think norms, especially when they're acting like virtual engines, really do regulate uh, our, our you know practices that we want to engage in. So um, parsimony uh, is an interesting one uh, because the problem with it is it's and this is one of the problems with Occam's razor is people think they know what they're talking about, uh, but actually trying to specify, take the design stance, try to give a machine, you know, uh, the principle of parsimony. What does that mean for it? You know, don't multiply entities beyond, you know, this is typical, but don't, don't use more entities than you need to explain something. Well, entities are not, they don't come pre-packaged and individuated, I mean, when I say that evolution is caused by natural selection, is natural selection one entity? How do you count it? Um, no, it's a whole raft of things that have to come together. So was that a simple thing that Darwin did in comparison to Paley or a more complex thing? Uh, the problem with, with, with simplicity it, the, is that the only formal version that I, I find sort of interesting or convincing, Golmogorov uh, simplicity, is literally computationally intractable. Um, so all we ever do is use heuristic approximations for it. So I'm going to collapse parsimony for that reason back into like any of the other heuristics that we use. And like, like, and we have to use those heuristics because mm -hmm. we do not pre-specify and bias where, where, where we look for information, we are going to hit culminatorial explosion and commit cognitive suicide. Um, the trick is not to try and escape from heuristics. Um, and this is what Leo and I argued in the paper. No, sorry, Tim and uh, Tim Lillicrap and Blake Richards and I argued in the relevance realization papers. You want to get sets of complementary heuristics that can act as checks and balances on each other. Um, because you can't really be free from heuristics. So um, I, what I don't think heuristics condemn us to falsity. And I don't think the fact that we're using norms and there aren't norms right written into the fabrics of physics also uh, undermines our use of norms. There, you know, practices and forms of interactions are regulated and constituted uh, by the virtual engines govern them. And norms are typically ways of trying to state virtues, state way, state ways in which you create the conditions in which a practice will exist, you know, and so this is the notion of constitutive norms as opposed to objective values. You know, if I want to play, you know, football, I have to follow the rules, not because the rules are written into physics, but because if I don't follow the rules, I can't do the thing I want to do, which is to play football. In a similar way, you know, if I want to try and gain knowledge, learn and solve problems, I have to use heuristics. Now I can use them better or worse. And that's the choice that's up to me. So I think there's a constitutive necessity to call of there's a constitutive necessity 
cognitive agents. If you want to play the game of cognitive agency, there are norms that you need in order to engage in the practice. Then you may, and then you may ask, well, what's the ultimate value of the practice? Well, solving problems is uh, that on which all of your cognitive agency depends. Um, and, and I don't think you can live in existence in which you say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to solve problems anymore. Uh, that doesn't seem to me to be any way viable. So the move I made in the, in the answer was, I tried to show you that parsimony just becomes another heuristic. The heuristic are constitutive norms, not objective values written into the physics. That's fine. That's how most practices operate. And then within that, what we should think about is not just using heuristics individually, but how we can constellate them together so we get the most self-corrective process possible. Great. Uh, any any other? I uh, hope ho I hope that answers your question, Antalicia. Uh, any other uh, other questions? I heard some people speak up before. Well, I have a question, but I'm not quite sure how to phrase it. It's been uh, beating me up a little lately. Um, they've started opening up in our state uh, more businesses for economic purposes, so people can get out and about. And I just had the feeling like, oh my gosh, this new emerging paradigm that we've all hoped for is like, that was it. It's like, we're, we're not going back to the old. And so um, I heard uh, John, you say, uh, fake it till you make it. You were talking to Jordan. This was about five months ago before a lot of this started. And, and so uh, faking it till we make it, uh, being emerged in practices is I believe what you're speaking of. Um, yeah. So that's kind of a law of attraction principle. And so I'm just thinking, how can we uh, at this point with this emerging paradigm, get on board where we're uh, co-creating it, imagining it, focusing on what? And you know, I understand a paradigm you can recreate in your own being. I'm thinking, you know, globally, much like what you two are talking about. And so, um, you know, first you decide what you want, and we've kind of done that. You have this amazing platform here now uh, on Discord and all of your uh, wonderful offerings. So, you know, we kind of know where we want to go. But then the second part, it seems, of creating a paradigm is identifying the belief that supports the reality, emerging reality. And that's where, you know, I, there are so many different beliefs and they're all, you know, wonderful and they all go together. Uh, but I've noticed people change their beliefs. You know, even if I look back a year, we keep our core values and certain beliefs, of course, but, you know, to integrate beliefs and, and it was seeming like you were not wanting to, to go there. It's like, we'll start with the practices. We'll do the, the horizontal uh, you know, and then let the rest emerge. And, and I, I think that's what has to happen. The higher view, viewpoint, the story, what's our story, what's our narrative, the divine narrative, you know, that kind of emerges on its own. But yet, uh, you know, are there certain steps we can take to be doing the most we can uh, in this co-creation? It seems to me that sometimes uh, we have to be selective. Uh, and not just objective in what we're what we're looking at. We can choose what we want to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's how things have always been created by thought first. So, you know, this is your field. So, how do we uh, work this shift that's going on right now with with what uh, of our capacities that we have we can use? Um. So, so that was a lot. I'm trying to make sure that I parse it correctly. Um, so, you what? Are, your question could mean. You know, I think it means both. What What should I be doing individually, or what should we be doing collectively uh, to yeah, try? Sorry. Yeah, to try and sort of take take advantage of this kairos, this opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, to shift things. Um, so one of the things that, uh, you, I mean, you, you, well, you already know part of my answer because you alluded to it. 
I think we need to set up communities of practices and we need to set up communities of discourse. Here's, here's a community of discourse, but notice that it's not really tied to a community of practice other than discourse. Um, now, uh, Brett is doing some amazing things about trying to link you to communities of practices. Uh, so for example, I'm doing the, uh, the live stream meditation class um, right now, and, what's, and that's a community of practice. Obviously, I'm, I'm teaching them things, but that's mo we're not there primarily to discuss. We're there to learn a practice, learn it together, and then whatever, whatever the discussion that emerges, it's discussion around the practice. And so what we need to think about, uh, and this is part of what Jordan Hall and I are trying to talk about, is how do we get these various communities, communities of disc different communities of discourse, different communities of practice, um, to start um, talking uh, to each other and practicing with each other. Now, that's already happening. I, I mean, I, I'm not taking on some titanic responsibility. I just want to facilitate something that's already happening. More and more people are trying to, to say, well, what would it be like if we, you know, the people who belonged to a community of discourse all, also belong to a community of practice? And what if people who were both talking and practicing also started to generate, you know, a, a community of generation uh, where they're starting to uh, generate uh, ideas, put things out to the, uh, the, the the wider society. Because, and you, you obviously know what model I'm thinking here. I'm trying to think about all the ways in which religions sort of went from being nascent clusters of small group movements into something mm -hmm. that became more comprehensive. And so... That's the kind of strategy I think we have to pursue. And then a way, you know, a way to do that, you know, the individual role in that is if you want to partake in, you know, uh, founding uh, different communities and then forming a small world network between them. Because I think that we should use small world network structures, not hierarchical structures. We should organize them the way the brain organizes its processing. Um, but um, what you should think and, and what we should all think, myself included, is, well, what are the requisite sets of virtues, where by virtue I mean, you know, skills, states of mind, states yeah. of character, um, what are the requisite virtues that I would need in order to help found and connect these kinds of communities together and then start cultivating them? Uh, and, 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 I, and I don't say that dismissively or trivially. I know that that's a, that's a huge thing uh, to put on people. Um, and, but so I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be in any way, uh, you know, authoritative. What, what I'm trying to say is that's what I think is needed. That idea of trying to create these meta communities um, and then trying to individually cultivate the skills that are needed in order to create these meta communities. Well, this is probably a good place to plug that a few of us, it's been a small group, but on as, as you, John, are doing your meditation class on YouTube, a few of us have been meeting here on Discord, where we listen on YouTube and mute, and then afterwards, you know, chat a little bit about excellent. our experience. Excellent, excellent. And I mean, if that, you know, and so if, if, that, if that group becomes a bridging group, you know, bridging between ideas is one thing. Bridging between groups is, 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 is another thing. And if this group that you're talking about, Brett, you know, if it becomes a bridging group between uh, the, the, you know, the meditation and contemplation sangha and then this larger discord group here, that would be the kind of thing I'm exactly talking about. And, of course, everyone is welcome. So the more the merrier. Uh, to join us. Uh, it's uh, Monday to Friday at 9.30 Eastern, as long as John's doing it. And maybe, uh, I, I know, John, you're in your, your last week of your course. I'm not sure what you're... Oh, no. What you're... So just, just, to, just to, well, here's a good time to talk about that. Now, we're going to go forward. So I'm going to okay. teach, I'm going to, there's some things I'm going to continue to teach from this tradition, a little bit more advanced. Um, and then we're probably going to, right, so uh, what we're going to do is, is because we're getting a lot of requests for people who are just finding out about it. We're going to alternate. So we'll go a week where we have a Dharma day, a teaching day on Monday, and then the rest of the week is sit. And then we'll have, we'll, we'll have a week that's just sitting thereafter. So there'll only be a Dharma uh, once every two weeks. And I'll, so there'll be about 
three or four more Dharma sessions doing a little. So that'll take us a, a couple months in. And then by that time, um, we're probably going to shift to a format where we have something like what I call the wisdom sangha, uh, which I've run that in person before for about five years. And so I've got some sense of how that would look going forward. But I need to work with Omar a lot more because it's going to be handled through, of course, a different medium, um, et cetera. But that's sort of the overarching plan. So this is not coming to an end anytime soon. Great. So everyone, please, please join us uh, weekdays, 930 for, for that uh, here in the Discord. Uh, anyone else have a have a question? Uh, hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, very nice to be able to speak with you like this. Um, uh, it's a little off topic, but I'm just very curious. You mentioned in your meditation course that you have uh, um, a shiatsu uh, therapy yeah. as practice, and I was curious if you can explain a little about that. That connects to your work. Oh, so. I mean, that was uh, very much, uh, you know, me trying to recapitulate, uh, recapture, I should have said, recapture um, the, you know, the an ancient ecology of practices. So, uh, so I had a, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this is all around cultivating uh, the virtue of mindfulness, which I do not think uh, is, uh, well, I, I shouldn't be speaking so strongly. I'll just say what I think is better. I think what is best is to have to have a meditative practice, a meditative sitting practice, a contemplative sitting practice. You need some moving mindfulness practice like Tai Chi Chuan, um, Qi Kung, things like that. And then you need uh, not only is it a moving mindfulness practice, but it's interpersonal and it, it, it is healing. And that's what that's what Shiatsu was. So I actually got training in Zen Shiatsu, um, which is. Um, you know, it's, it, it's in the family of things like acupuncture and acupressure. It's like yeah. acupressure, uh, but it's rhythmic and you trace out entire lines upon, uh, the body. And what, what's that, what that is good for is it's good for dealing with things that are, uh, psychosomatic and psychogenic, uh, that, and therefore fall between the cracks of, of sort of Western therapy, um, because it's not, you know, physical health or mental health that you're addressing, and it's not trauma or infection. It's more how people, uh, you know, might be that the the, the mind body relationship is sort of getting out of sync for them in particular ways, and that might express itself psychosomatically uh, in a physical way, or it might just be, you know, like I said, a, a psychogenic thing. Uh, and so, what you're doing is. It's really interesting because, like I say, you, you you have to be in a mindful state yourself and you do this rhythmic. It's almost like the person's body becomes, and I don't mean this in any graphic or sexual way, the person's body becomes like a musical instrument and then you're sort of tracing patterns on, a, on it. And the idea is this is a very, you know, interactional and mimetic way in which people sort of catch your mindfulness, catch it, and, and but they're also put into a deeply receptive state um, and then they get sort of in that mindfulness is sort of tracing out uh, patterns of nerve stimulation, which sort of help people, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, reconnect um, uh, areas of the brain um, and areas of the nervous system together in, in sort of new patterns. And, and that helps uh, people very, very, very considerably. I mean, I, I'm very critical of people who take a magical attitude towards this and that they're moving around unseen energy or stuff like that. I think there's a completely naturalistic and important uh, explanation of chi or ki, and I'm going to be publishing a paper on that hopefully this year. It's it's pretty much written and it's about to be submitted. Um, so and and then and it may make panaceic claims about shiatsu, like it will cure cancer or uh, you know help you if you got um, the measles or something. Uh, no, it won't. But it does do well for, like I say, that intercategorical place where people are disordered and not at ease, diseased um, um, in their minds and bodies and the relationship between mind and body. It's very powerful. And so when you see 
when you sort of can share mindfulness in that procedural and perspectival way, um, it's, it really, um, it's really interesting what happens. There's some evidence I've seen um, sort of EEG and stuff like that when people are, uh, when a therapist is giving shiatsu, you can see the brainwave patterns become much more concordant uh, with each other. Yeah. And we know that this starts to happen anyways when people are doing distributed cognition. So I think a healing practice is really important for showing you the uh, potential of mindfulness to be something at work within distributed cognition and also uh, sort of its capacity to orient you towards healing other people, which is, is an important way of deeply remembering um, our interconnectedness with other people. So, sorry, I, I, hope, that <laughs> I hope that helped. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, my mother is a shiatsu therapist, and I guess I also fear away from the uh, people who follow it religiously, but I also believe there is truth to it, and yeah. it was very helpful, and I'm very uh, looking forward to the paper. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Good question. Can I jump in or line up? Go ahead. Yeah, go go ahead. So, so John, um, I've been I've been following your project and listening to your videos, and um, uh, recently I've started reading um, into some into postmodern theology. I wonder if there's some overlap between your project and what's going on there. Um, I can set this up a bit um as i understand it there's sort of two main movements um, one movement is um radical orthodoxy and they have a similar genealogy um they sort of uh, tell the story of um the the decline into nihilism starting with with scotus and uh, probably discardus um, and, and their sort of um way of addressing that is to Break down the dualism between nature and grace and put an ontology of participation. Yeah. Um, to be people like um, John Milbank and others. And then there's a, a, another movement within uh, postmodern theology, which includes people like John Caputo. Yeah. yeah. I've been influenced by Derrida and Tillich, who I, I know you're also a, a fan of. And I, he also speaks of a religion without a religion. And I notice you've similar terminology so wondering if if you've been influenced by any of those thinkers or yeah engage with their work yeah um so I, I, john caputo has had a considerable influence on me um his book on the mystical element in heidegger's thought was very formative for me um and so i know that branch uh of, of postmodern theology uh very well um I've read a lot of Derrida, studied it, taking courses on it, et cetera. Uh, and so, I, and I've seen some of the interaction uh, between Derrida and sort of negative theology and Jean-Luc Merian's work, uh, you know, um, God Without Being. So I'm aware of that strength. Milbank, I don't know. I, this is your, the second person in a week that has recommended that, uh, that name to me. Um, and so on Milbank, I'm, I, I just have a very, very minimal passing knowledge. I see him cited in some of the other books um, I've been reading, especially mm -hmm. books around uh, the mystical origins of, of Orthodox Christianity. Um, and, you know, I, I see Marian being very, very deeply influenced uh, uh, by Neoplatonism. Um, and so all of those things, and, and as is Caputo, um, I've also read um, Mark Taylor, who is also um, a postmodern the theologian, historian of religion, and his book, After God, um, has had just a huge impact on me as well. Um, so in terms of the, the influence, some of the strands, the ones that I've mentioned, um, especially uh, Mark Taylor and mm -hmm. John Caputo, have definitely had a huge impact on my thinking. Yeah, that's, that's, that's helpful. Um, I, I, I mentioned Milbank 
um, I don't know how well this overlaps with your project, but just his is in radical orthodoxy's discussion on the ontology of participation and uh, to break down the distinction between nature and grace. I wonder if that sort of um, acts at all with uh, what so, you were talking about with the axial age religion. Yeah, yeah. You cut out for a sec. Was the person you referred to, was that Millbank? Is that what you just described? Is that Millbank's project? Yes. Yeah. So what, what book would you recommend as... You know, um, I, I, I'm philosophically educated, so I don't need sort of a, a, a an introduction. But what's a, a good book by his to you know get it get up to the core of of his work? Yeah, I'm I'm the wrong person to ask. I'm I mean, I I've just been reading an introductory book myself, so I okay. I just I just noticed some parallels between what you're up to, and I I wanted to put that out there and see what you're so. Yeah, I mean, and this goes towards something that I said to Paul Vanderclay and Jonathan Pajot. I mean, I don't have a foreclosure argument. It, it may be that Christianity, in you know, in, in the ways you're describing here, but also in ways that I think have to deal with the narrative issue and the narrative metaphysics that were talked about earlier. Um, is it possible that Christianity might reformulate itself and break the stranglehold that the axial age mythos and grammar have on our thinking and afford us a way back? Um, into right relationship with being and a response to nihilism, it's possible. And when you know, when I when I hear about this, the kind of stuff you're talking about, that, you know, that's why I want to keep keep the discussion going. Um, I still have the criticisms, and you've heard them mentioned earlier. Uh, but it's I think it's also trying to predict what a religion will do and how it will go is a really really tricky thing to do. And I always make I always state that how it seems to me, because that's, I, I don't think I have any right to claim beyond that, how it seems to me is that Christianity will not be able to reformulate itself to address these problems. Um, and But I also always acknowledge that that is not a foreclosure argument. Uh, I'm really, really hesitant to, to people who make sort of foreclosure arguments. And uh, so there, that's my answer to that. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll leave this, um, leave the questions to someone else, but, but yeah, thanks. You're welcome. I think we just have, what, a, a few minutes left. Uh, are there any other questions uh, that anyone has? Um, well, I've got another question, question, but... Sorry, go ahead. Um, I, I had a question about... Um, if there is a dynamical relationship between the agent arena system, can this be uh, data? Uh, can this be simulated through data, or what kind of data input we can ever have? Yeah, um, that's really, and that's a really good question. Uh, so I'm working on some, with somebody right now. So obviously, you know, that's a that's a broad sort of philosophical construct, and you, what you have to do is you have to via you know, good theory, you have to specify it into particular, more specific uh, constructs and entities. And so one of the ways we're trying to do that, one more thing I want to do is I want to study uh, uh, conversational patterns uh, and see, and, and so what happens in things like circling is people get into like a collective flow state. And while it's self-organizing, um, it's, it's generally not, uh, it's generally not self-perpetuating, um, at least initially, or 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 maybe I, again, this is an empirical hypothesis. So I'm just I'm just stating suspicions here. What I want to what I want to study is this: when people are getting into distributed flow because they've got a particular network, does that then lead them to modify the parameters of the interaction so that they keep refining flow together? So. So, so they put parameters on the state space to create an attractor that keeps bringing them into configurations of interaction that maintains the distributed flow state. And, and that's something I, I'm, 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 first of all, we're trying to work out the theory and the math and then see if we see how we could go about trying to actually measure that in, in action. So that's the kind of thing I think uh, that that was in no way exhaustive. You understand that, please. That is an example yeah. of how you can take the general principle, specify it in one way, and then do an empirical investigation. You'd need to do tons of those, right? And then mm -hmm. once you've got all the varied set, try and not, not like after you've done a lot of top downing into various specifications, 
then gather them together and do the inference to the best explanation bottom up and try and extract from all of it more general principles that are nevertheless built on specific empirically tractable constructs. So that's the kind of thing I think you should do. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Here, we have a, a question from student of movement in the, in the text chat. Uh, one of the issues you bring up is with regard to our current scientific worldview no longer being compatible with axial age two worlds mythology. One thing Bard, one thing Bard proposes, is a move, is a move towards mo monistic versions of religion. I see the later developments. Many of the traditions move towards a type of monism, non-dualism, to resolve this issue. Whether it's in Buddhism with the form with the move from early forms to Mahayana, right. uh, not, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, or, samsa, or samsara is nirvana, etc. Or my understanding of contemplative mystical Christianity, example, Jesus pointing out how heaven is present within. Essentially, they move from two worlds being places to psychological states. Comments or thoughts on this approach? So I agree with everything until the very last statement. Um, they don't move to, I wouldn't say psychological states. Um, I, that's one of my criticisms of, of Jung. I think they move to a constellation of cognitive states and existential modes, and also patterns of distributed cognition and cultural systems. Um, so, so, um, so what I'm saying is the locus for where it's found, you, you, the ontology of monism is not, um, it's not the same as saying everything is just, um, a psychological state. So the primary argument, I think, for why that happens is found in Spinoza. Um, Spinoza's argument is, if we think sort of a Tillichian idea that we're trying to get um, some relationship to what's ultimate, I'll try and use that as a neutral term the way Tillich does. Um, and then Spinoza's basic argument is, um, uh, if you have any kind of dualism, you haven't you haven't achieved ultimacy uh, because the, each one limits the other and the principle that unites them and, and affords their common interaction is actually um, the ultimate principle. So that, that kind of arguments for non monism, I think, are very important. And so that's a conceptual argument for ultimacy and monism. And then we have, you know, a, a, a similar argument uh, for physicalism uh, within the philo within the philosophical foundations of uh, of current science, and I do think that both of those sort of, uh, if you'll allow me to, because to, I'm running out of time to speak very a little a, a little looser, you know, the movement of monism within sort of the existential project of coming into right relationship uh, with uh, ultimacy. So within, you know. With, with not not within monism, the movement towards monism within sort of a religious arena, uh, as we try to get into right relationship with ultimacy, and then the movement uh, within um, our scientific metaphysics to get um, an integrated account. Uh, and this is the, the argument for this is that um, realness is dependent upon judgments of realness. At least I'll try to not speak so metaphysically. Uh, judgments of realness are dependent upon judgments of intelligibility, and judgments of intelligibility need a co need common principles of intelligibility, need an integrated, coherent account, etc. And so, whenever you're positing two worlds, you're actually undermining intelligibility. And so, you get an epistemological argument within uh, science for why we should move to monism, and then you've got an, a, an existential argument within religion why we should move to monism, and the thing that needs to happen, and Spinoza is an exemplar of somebody who does it. His book is called The Ethics, which is all about our aspiration to right relationship with what's ultimate and blessedness, but he's writing it in a logical, mathematical form, emulating, and I think mastering, the Cartesian science of his time. He's right in the heart of the scientific revolution. And Spinoza was trying to show how those two things uh, could be folded together. And so I think, um, sorry, this sounds pretentious. I aspire to seeing myself in his lineage. I didn't get to talk about him very much in the series because he's kind, he was kind of actually orthogonal to the history, unfortunately. Uh, but for me, you know, I've read the 
ha, this is a bit of a pun. I've read the ethics religiously, like every day, like the Divina, read on it, study it, reflect on it, read commentaries, go back and back again, until you start to see the world the way Spinoza saw it, until you actually get Scienza Intuitiva, not just reading about it. And so I see myself in that lineage with Spinoza of trying to, I take very seriously these, right, these existential and epistemological arguments for monism. And then how do we realize this? How do we realize this? And that's very much, I think, the way we have to go. Uh, I, it, it, so although I don't have a foreclosure argument on Christianity, and I still stand by that, or Buddhism, I'll still stand by that, I think, that, I think dualism is doomed. I think dualism, all the dualisms, the mind-body dualism, supernatural, natural, I think all of those dualisms are ultimately doomed. I had to rush through those two arguments, the existential and the convergence between the existential and the epistemological. But I was trying to give you a gesture as to why I think the dualisms are doomed. It sounds like a good title for a book. And <laughs> dualism <laughs> is doomed. <laughs> so so I, I think I think you're out of time. Uh, so thank you so much. This was great. The hour went by very, very quickly. Uh, thank you, everyone who asked questions. Don't worry, in two weeks. We will be doing another another one of these, so you'll have you'll have your chance to ask uh, ask all those questions then. So thank you very much, John. Really appreciate it and appreciate your time. And I think this was great. Thank you so much. The questions and the interaction. I'm really impressed again, as I was last time, with the quality of these questions and the willingness of people to enter into you know uh, a cooperative dialogue about it and back and forth and really try to unpack things together. Uh, I really enjoyed my time. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Take care. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Great. Thanks, everyone. You guys don't have to go. You can continue uh, chatting, of course. Uh, and thanks, Tyler, for uh, for recording today. Appreciate it.